morning. morning. It's good to be with you this morning. I just want to give all the fathers here, first and foremost, a shout out this morning. Happy Father's Day. Give them a round of applause. I'm glad to see so many fathers here today. It's a great thing. So I do just want to mention that we're having a donut Sunday afterwards, so uh, you get to have some great food. And I'm also getting slimed with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So uh, don't miss that. But I'm going to eat first, so we'll see. So uh, why don't we give the kids a round of applause as well. They did a great job this year. And for those of you who don't know me, if you're new, my name is Brendan, and I'm the pastor here at Jefferson Baptist Church, and I'm very glad that you're visiting with us this morning. So we normally do offer children's church at this time, uh, but since it's a BBS Sunday and closing program, we're having everybody here. And the sermon I'm going to preach is hopefully not too long, uh, but it's also going to incorporate your kids as well. And so um, if you would, please turn your Bibles or devices to Ephesians. We're going to be in chapter 6. And I'm going to focus on chapter 6, verses 10 through 17 for my sermon. If you have your pew Bible there, it's on page 1,824. And this past week, your kids were able to learn from God's Word about the armor of God. Ephesians 6 is where this armor is explained to us by the Apostle Paul, the author of the letter to the Ephesian church. And so let's listen to his word to us and what he wrote at that time. This is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10, and I'm going to read through verse 20 and focus on just 17 verses there. So, listen to God's word. Finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador and change, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is God's word. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, uh, we ask that you would just come with us and be with us now by the power of your spirit. So that we can not just hear your words, but we can hear it and understand it and allow it to penetrate both our minds and our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we think about the need for armor, we usually think about a battle of some type or some type of combat, like a knight jousting or an open battlefield. So if that's the case, why would regular old Christians in the city of Ephesus during the first century have needed to wear spiritual armor? Why would they have needed the armor of their God to help protect them in a fight? Why would we need the armor? Well, in Ephesus, it was a great city. It was a port city where ships would come and go, and there was lots of commerce and trading that happened. And along with the different items to sell and trade, people would also bring all kinds of different religious ideas there to the city. Some of those ideas were very dark. There was occult worship. There was black magic and idol worship as well. And since Christians claimed to worship the living God and were telling people that other religious uh, worshipers were wrong and they needed to believe in the true God, the other religious worshipers weren't too happy about that. Not only that, but there would also even grow to be division among the members of the Ephesian church that could lead them away from the truth. So when we read Paul's concluding words to them, it should be no surprise that he's trying to prepare them for a battle. Paul was telling the Ephesian church to armor up. They needed to do so because there were in a spiritual war that could harm them significantly or eternally if they failed to fight. But what's important to understand is that this battle, Paul warned the Ephesians, 
about still raging around us today. Now kids, you learned about it this week, and you learned why the armor we put on is so important. And I want you to listen closely as I preach because I'm going to say armor up at the end of the time when I'm going through the armor, and you're going to say with truth or with peace and so on. And so pay attention. But parents, I also want you to listen even more closely because as we continue, I'll mainly be directing the call to armor up to you. Your kids have armored up this week, and now you must armor up to help them in the fight for their souls in a world that is so clearly at odds as to whether things are good and evil and how those pertain to your children. So I want you to armor up today. We are to armor up. First, to stand against the devil, and then second, to armor up with the whole armor of God. So we're to armor up to stand against the devil. Paul is wrapping up his letter to the Ephesian church. Chapter 6 is towards the end of the book. And what is common for Paul to do at the end of his letter is to give the church directions or commands. They're not always positive or lighthearted directions either. Many times they're serious and require detailed attention so that those who are listening could implement what Paul was asking them to do. In our text today, the directions Paul gave to the Ephesians were very specific and asked the Ephesians to be courageous. Just like when you grab your child's attention because you want them to listen to you, you're saying uh, by telling them, like, look here and listen, or when you yell at your kid because they're going to get burned. So Paul was giving warnings and directions to the church so they would be safe and ready to fight a spiritual war, and he's doing the same for us today. So the first direction Paul gave was to be strong. And kids, you know, verse 10, it was your memory verse this week. So it's up on the screen here. Say it with me. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, he wasn't telling the Ephesians to be strong in their own strength. He was telling the Ephesians to be strong in the ability and the power that the Lord supplies for them. Which means, as we seek to armor up today, the only way we can stand firm against the devil while wearing our spiritual armor is by the Lord's help. Only when he empowers us by his Holy Spirit do we have the proper credentials to receive our armor... And only through his dwelling within us by the Holy Spirit will we have the supernatural strength to hold up the weight of such magnificent and glorious armor. So Paul directed the church to put on the whole armor of God. But before he detailed what the armor was, he tells them that they're going to be fighting a battle. He's telling them the reason why they need the armor. And we read this in verse 11 and 12. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So we're to armor up to stand against the devil. And the schemes of the devil are everywhere. What Paul described here is that we are in a battle that is beyond our ability to see with our eyes at times. The powers that come against us as followers of Jesus or just as regular people are cosmic. They are evil in heavenly places in the spiritual realm that's unseen to us. But the devil also uses people and the ideas of those people to try and advance his kingdom of darkness. Rulers and authorities are mentioned here in our text. And these are people who have power in this world. These are people who can be used by the devil to do harm in all sorts of different ways. Right now, we're living in a time when our authorities and rulers are being manipulated by forces beyond them. They're failing to see the darkness that they are bringing upon the world due to the ideas they're pushing into the institutions of our societies. This darkness is creeping into our homes through the TV or social media, into our schools through curriculum with political agendas, and into our businesses and governments through training programs that fuel hatred and division. And the reason I'm speaking to us as guardians and parents of these hard realities is because your kiddos need to be defended against the forces that are not, that they don't understand. They're not old enough to understand these forces that are working against them. And if they have become aware of some of these forces, they might not understand that they need help to overcome them. And some pastors and ministers say that if the hearts of your kids are captured here at church, they'll bring you here. And they did bring you here today. So that's true. But I want to capture your hearts, parents, and guardians of these little ones. Because whether you realize it or not, you stand, along with us all, on a universal and cosmic battlefield for the hearts and the minds of the next generation of the church 
and of our nation. And unless we come to Jesus Christ, the only true and victorious king, to supply us with his eternal and impenetrable armor, we will lose the battle for the souls of our children who build both the church and all of society. And so we must put on the armor of God by armoring up to stand against the devil and his schemes. And to armor up, we must also know what we're to wear, what armor we're to put on, which is why Paul gives us the whole armor of God that we're to armor up with. So we're to armor up to stand against the devil and to armor up with the whole armor of God. Now this armor, in many ways, was reflective of the armor a Roman foot soldier would wear during the first century. But it's also called the armor of God, which means it was, in Paul's mind, connected to the Messiah, or the Savior of Israel that would come. Now the quality of this armor was much different than bronze or iron. The quality of this armor was heavenly. And all the pieces of the armor are interconnected and essential to be victorious in the war that we're in. And so listen to them again from verse 13 through 17 as we read. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Paul is acting like a commanding officer for the church here, as he called them to attention, as he gave directions to them, as he said, therefore, take up the whole armor of God for the second time. The church was to stand as soldiers, ready for the fight against evil on the day that it would arrive. For us, the evil day is not almost here. The evil day is today, which is why we need to armor up all the more. And the first piece of armor that Paul listed was the belt of truth. The belt would help secure a soldier's armor in place so it wasn't disconnected, leaving him more vulnerable in battle. It would also be where he sheathed his sword. If the soldiers lost his belt, his armor would not function properly. And his sword, his offensive weapon, could be lost along with his belt. So the belt of truth is important for us today as we enter into cosmic warfare because we're in a time when good is evil, evil is good, up is down, and down is up. There are some who say two plus two isn't even four anymore. And some of us aren't sure whether anything is real or whether everything's just a bad simulation or a nightmare we haven't woken up from yet. As individuals, we're confused. We're falling apart in isolation, loneliness. We have anxiety over what's happening in our world. We are, in many ways, trying to balance on a hoverboard that's gone haywire. We're trying to live in ways that says truth is only what we make it to be, or we might simply believe there is no truth. But if there's no truth, then everything falls apart. Because without truth, there's no foundation on which to stand. There's no common reality or direction that binds us together. We all end up like sandcastles at high tide, undone by the waters that crash over us in this life. Without truth, we become like the armor without the belt, ineffective for battle. And if we're to armor up and have a suit of armor that will not shift or unbuckle as we fight, we must put on the belt of truth. But what is truth? Well, truth is found in the unchangeable realities of the world around us that God has created, like the way that grass is green and the sky is blue, or how gravity is 9.8 meters per second square, or the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, or how God created us, male and female, in his likeness to project his glory and image into the world around us. But the height of truth is found in one person, and it's found in the person Jesus Christ. Christ. In John 14, 6, he told his disciples that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Which means that the whole armor we're to put on begins and ends with Jesus, the risen and glorified King who is in heaven. Without him, it all falls apart. There's no greater truth than Jesus and his word given to us in the Bible. And without trust in Jesus, we cannot put on the rest of the armor either. So if you're here today and you do not know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, then turn to him and find the only truth that can satisfy your soul, that gives you understanding and hope in this crazy world. You see, when you believe in Jesus, you will be given eternal life and filled with the Spirit of God. 
to be taken in as a child of the living God, and you'll be given the right and the power to put on the rest of the armor. You need to stand victorious in the battle. We are all to fight whether we want to fight it or not. And so kids, here's your cue. Armor up with truth. There it is. One more time. Armor up with truth. There it is. Good. So next, we're to put on the breastplate of righteousness. In verse 14, we read this. And stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, kids, this week we call the breastplate justice. So when I say righteousness at the end, or when I say armor up at the end, just say justice, whichever one you learn. So Paul here is describing a metal plate that would uh, cover the torso of a soldier, where the heart and lungs and the vital organs would have been at. It would go over top of the chain mail and act as an extra layer of defense against arrows, swords, and spears. So when you rest your faith in the truth of the gospel, you are declared before God to be righteous. You receive the product of divine justice. Because when you receive Jesus, you stand in a very real but metaphorical courtroom where God is the judge. and He is weighing the verdict of your eternal sentence, whether you are guilty or not, based on his perfect standards. The standards of loving your neighbor and loving God. But just before you get the sentence of guilty and are sentenced eternally to hell because you did not keep these standards to perfection, because nobody has, Jesus steps in and gives you his perfect record of keeping the law of God that takes your guilty sentence away, and then he takes it for you. And when this happens, you're declared in that courtroom righteous. You're no longer a criminal in God's sight. He becomes your father. And so we need the breastplate of righteousness because it allows us to be free of guilt. We're no longer clothed with the shame of the sins we have committed in our past. We're no longer covered by the shame of the sins we might be in this morning. With the breastplate of righteousness, Satan has nothing to hold against us and accuse us with. The devil can never undo what God has done by his declaration when you put your faith in him. You see, our hearts and our souls are protected because we know we are right with God through Jesus, our Lord. So we must wear the breastplate of righteousness in our fight. Kids, armor up. With justice. Good job. Which brings us to the shoes Paul told the Ephesian church that we need to wear. In verse 15 it says this, and As shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The reason foot soldiers were called foot soldiers was because, can anyone tell me? They walked on their feet. That's right. Paul was letting the church know they were to be foot soldiers of God's kingdom. And he wants us to understand the same. To be prepared. To go where he calls us and to be ready to do battle anywhere we might be. We have the coverings on our feet that won't let our feet get worn out, blistered, or beat up as we're battling. The sandals or shoes that we need are the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace allows us to be ready for the fight because we have peace with God. Just as we're clothed with the breastplate of righteousness and God gives us a right standing before him, so when we rest our faith in Jesus, we have peace with God through him. Jesus becomes the white flag that we surrender to God with. And not only that, he adds us into his own army. And so when we come to experience this peace, it should cause us to be overjoyed and ready to declare the good news as we go into our own battle. It makes it easy to move when we know that we're going to win the war because God is on our side and we fight for him and his kingdom. Our battle cry, our warrior shout, this gospel of peace is what keeps our feet moving forward. Our desire to save the souls of others who have not yet heard the message of peace with God through faith in Jesus is what readies us to march onward. Now the devil does not want our feet ready. He wants us to forego having peace with God. His desire is to keep us distracted, apathetic, or uninterested in the gospel so that we're not ready for the war. He wants our sneakers off so he can catch us more easily to do his will rather than the will of God. Which is why we must armor up today with the shoes of readiness given by the gospel of peace. So kids and everybody else, armor up with peace. peace. There we go. I think the parents might be asleep. Armor up with peace. peace. There we go. Next. We come to the shield of faith in verse 16. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, the shield of the Roman soldier that Paul would have had in mind was a big rectangular piece of metal 
It would have been about three to four feet wide, about six to eight feet tall. It would have been used by the soldiers in unison to create a barricade so they could move into a fortress without arrows sneaking through to wound or kill them as they, before they accomplished their charge. So as we consider taking up the shield of faith, we must once more understand that this faith is not a misplaced hope in ourselves or in something in this world. The only hope for an eternal battle is an eternal hope rested in an eternal Savior, Jesus Christ. Faith is something that keeps us committed to a cause as well. Trust in Jesus and his promise of eternal life to us and all who believe is the shield we raise so that we will not falter in this battle. We know Jesus is our Savior and our victorious Lord, which means that we too will overcome no matter how hot the darts of the devil are. He shoots at us. And the devil can throw some searing darts and shoot some burning arrows, can't he? There are sins we've committed that cause long-term damage like the scars of a serious burn. And there are things we face that, we, that wound us, that wound us very deeply. And only by armoring up with the shield of faith can we move forward protected and safe from all these fiery darts, whether they're from the past or whether they're coming at us in the future. All right, kids. Armor up with faith. You're pretty good. One more time. Armor up with faith. There we go. So the helmet of salvation comes into play next in verse 17. And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We'll get to the sword next. At this point, the armor Paul told the Ephesians to put on has covered every area of the body except the head. The helmet would keep the top of the head covered up. It was like the hard hat of the ancient world, or like some people call it, the brain bucket. It kept the control center of the body, the brain, safe. And the reason why we must armor up with the helmet of salvation is because we must never allow the reality of what Christ has accomplished for us through his gospel to leave our minds. It must be what transforms our thinking and the way we understand the world around us. The knowledge that we have been set free from sin and death does so much more than just a passing feeling or a brief religious experience can do. When you know for certain you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus, then you can be confident in your march toward victory in the battle. So this is the last one you learned this week, kids. Armor up with salvation. Good job. Which brings us to the final piece of armor. Well, it's more like a defensive weapon or an offensive weapon. So it's not really armor. But it's the sword of the Spirit. In verse 17, we read this again. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the sword of a Roman soldier, he carried it, and it was called a gladius. It's about two feet long with a handle of ivory and bone and wood. And the gladius was the Roman soldier's most reliable and effective offensive weapon. He always had it. And so the sword of the Spirit is the weapon that we must always have as Christians in order to win the fight that we're in. The sword of the Spirit is also defined by Paul as the Word of God. As those seeking to establish the kingdom of God, we have to pick up our Bibles. When we let the Bible teach us how to worship God and love our neighbors, we wield a sword that is far beyond any of our comprehensions. We wield the actual spoken words of God Almighty, the one who created the heavens and the earth, when he said, let it be, and it was. The words in this book are living and timeless. They hold promises of eternal blessing and hope for all who hear and respond to them by faith. They are how we defeat the schemes of the devil. Just like Jesus did in the desert when Satan was tempting him to fail in his mission to bring salvation for all people who believe. Jesus said to the devil, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And every time the devil tried to trick Jesus... He just used more scripture, and finally the devil left him alone. So we know God's word. When we know God's word and trust it to be true, we can never go wrong. We can never be shaken. For everything in here is for our greatest good and for God's glory. And through it we gain the victory over Satan when he tempts us to give up the fight. So we must armor up with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, which is the Bible, because it is our best and only offensive weapon in this fight. So, we're to armor up. First, so that we can stand against the devil and all his schemes. Second, we are to armor up with the whole armor of God, which is the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, 
the shoes of the readiness given by the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, so that we are properly equipped for battle. Don't leave here today without resting your faith in Jesus. Do not leave without armoring up for the fight. We're all in against the power of evil in this present age. Your children need you armored up by their side. So armor up. Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're glad you brought everybody here today. Very thankful that you have given us your word so that we can be prepared for this battle that we're all in. Now may you bless us as we go. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.